Gabriel, thank you so much for sitting with me. I should say for reference, we managed to get some time in before, had a sit down, had a natter, and then COVID came along yeah. and pretty much ruined everything. Yeah. So we thought we'd kind of get up for speed, but that's really great because you've been working away during COVID on some incredible projects that we'll come to. Um, I wanted to say firstly, thank you so much for, for doing this. And Pleasure. I'm going to blast through a million things, so <laughs> apologies in advance if it's a bit much, but I wanted to chat first about just your job. It feels like you have an awesome job. Do you wake up in the morning and think, yeah, this is, this is pretty cool, I'm doing what I love? Absolutely, yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. You have to remind yourself of that sometimes, don't you, when, when, you're, uh, you know, when things become a bit of a grind, when, when the days are long. Uh, well, maybe when the days aren't long enough, um, you can't get through things. But certainly, yeah, I mean, it was, it was one thing that my dad always said to me, make sure um, you do something you want to do. When you grow up, he didn't, he didn't give me too much advice, but that was one bit of advice he gave me which sort of stayed with me. And, and I always, uh, like yourself, I always loved football, I always loved sport, and uh, I always liked writing. And so to combine the two uh, in the way that I'm able to do and have been able to do has been yeah, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure and a privilege as well. What do you see yourself as primarily? Because you have a lot of strings to your bow, but when people kind of ask you what you do, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? I'd probably say uh, journalist, although it's becoming a bit more director, writer, um, because of uh, the more I'm able to do documentaries and film documentaries. But certainly I think I'd see myself first as a as a journalist, I qualified as a journalist in, in sort of the old fashioned way through the National Council, the Tr Council for Training of Journalist courses, which are still out there today. And um, that was after university. And so I got that foundation and I, I was always keen to get that, uh, whether it would take me into sport or not, although that was always my ambition at that point. So yeah, first of all, I think journalist, and then beyond that, Luckily, with television in particular, I've been able to develop more skills in relation to filmmaking and features making, which has led me into that area. As a journalist, you are, it feels to me anyway, it feels like you're always there. Like when the key moment comes along, it's so many times over, it's your voice that we hear asking the question to the key player at the key time. What do you put that down to? Is it a case of you? working your ass off and making sure that you are in the right places at the right time or do you put it down to the fact you sort of come across the the, the right moments just by fortune or what oh, no to? definitely i think um if, if you've been able to cover the champions league for 15 years and you've been able to do i think it's getting up to like seven eight world cups and seven eight european championships there are going to be some great matches you're going to be at so yeah that is that is purely down to you're in the right place at the right time of course, w w you have to remind yourself again, I'm in that place to do a job, so I cannot be casual. Uh, I, I, I do work hard and I have worked hard. And um, you have to remind yourself, the more that you do it, just don't become complacent while you do it. So um, maybe that's what, what you're referring to. I think it's that um, when you're in that moment, make sure that you, you don't let it pass you by if you can possibly help it. So that must be particularly prominent on Champions League final nights, for example. And I think when we spoke before, one of the one of the evenings that you spoke about was Istanbul. Is that right? That you yeah. were doing the post-match interviews at Istanbul, yeah. and there's so much emotion yeah. in that situation. At what point are you sort of getting yourself ready? Because I, I mean, during a penalty shootout, you're on the cusp of interviewing someone who is probably close to tears because they've lost or the cusp of interviewing Steven Gerrard, who's on the cusp, on the edge of tears because he's just won the Champions League. How do you prep yeah. for that? I don't know if you can really. I think there's a, de there's a degree of um, when it reaches that stage. Because if you've, for instance, if you've made a few notes about what you might be doing on that night, for instance, you know, every, every reporter will have ripped, ripped his initial or her initial uh, notations up, wouldn't they? You know, I mean, you, what, what happened was truly incredible. So I think there's a degree of going, well, I'll just wing it to a degree that you just have to, obviously there are key points that you have to remember that you've got to cover with certain individuals that you hope to interview after that game, like a Steven Gerrard, for instance. 
And I think somewhere in the conversation there was, is this going to be your last game for Liverpool? Because he was very, very strongly linked at that point with a move to Chelsea. And, it, and I think it was very close to happening, as we've since found out. So in, in and amongst all that, you're still thinking, when is the right moment to ask that question? But we sort of think, I, th I think I know what the answer is going to be now that you've had your greatest night in Liverpool colours. But you're never, never sure. And you're never, that's the beauty of it. You're never quite certain, even if a question might be obvious. And some people might say, well, why is he asking that? Why is he, why is he, why is he asking Stephen Gerrard about his future uh, at this moment? You ask it just because he might say, this is my final game. That's why you ask it. Just because just he might say, um, actually, I've had enough. You, you almost certainly know he won't say that, but there, are, there have been moments when you get that surprise answer. Uh, but to, to go back to your original point, I think of those really emotional moments, you have to try and remain cool, which isn't always easy. And sometimes I think my emotion has come through, uh, through sheer... Um, uh, through a sheer sense, I think, of get, joining in the emotion of the player to help get the best out of that player. I think sometimes you can't, you can't be too straight in, in what you're asking at moments like that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think to a degree, you have to remember in the back of your mind there are some key points that I've got to cover, but equally, you've got to go through the basics and let them do the talking. So I'm going to put you on the spot now. When are those moments where you feel like your emotion has been lifted by what you're doing? That, that was one of those nights. That was one of those nights because it, it just grew and grew and grew and grew in, in this inexplicable way. So that was one of those nights. But what, what was really enjoyable for me that night was that so often with ITV in particular, your running times are very short for interviews. So... Um, not so much on a Champions League final night, but on maybe many of the Champions League semi-finals, quarter-finals, England nights. Uh, those nights are about getting the best 90 seconds you can get, and that's all you've got. You've got to cover the points as much as you can in those 90 seconds, two minutes, and that's it. That's all you're going to get the time to run, because ITV's running times aren't like Sports Channel running times. That night in Istanbul was longer, and... Um, one of the great pleasures of it, and I think one of the reasons why it became more of a sort of emotional experience for me was that we, we were able to start with Stephen Gerrard, I think, and then a floor manager, Chuck Taylor, did superbly. He then got in Jertsey Dudek. We rolled on with Jertsey. In came John Arnarisa, in came Vladimir Smitsa. It became one sort of stream of consciousness, which was fantastic. And um, also credit to the to the producer that night, David Moss, who, who enabled that interview experience, if you like, to continue. So I think that was, that was a, a wonderful experience for me because you were able to develop almost this one long interview in which you encapsulated everything. And I think a lot of Liverpool fans and even neutral fans enjoyed that. That's a dream, isn't it? When you get into that situation where it just feels like there's an electricity, you're just going interview, 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 and you're able to just be completely in it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a total privilege and it's a rare thing, uh, a rare thing. And I suppose if it was a regular thing, it, it would lose its power, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's very true. Um, you, you mentioned just then the idea of when is the right moment to ask a question? And I, I'm sure for some people, they maybe might see that in a, in a reductionist way, but that is, to me, that is so crucial there's a feeling, isn't there, when you're in, a, in an interview, and maybe with someone who's a bit prickly or a bit frosty, or someone that could be um, could flip quite quickly between being incredibly comfortable to being a little bit hostile, mm. you're walking a tightrope, aren't you? You're on a very fine balance, and sometimes one word could yeah. throw someone during an interview. Yeah, but I think you you know there are certain questions that you know you'll have to ask. For instance, I think that you feel you really need to cover. And if you don't ask the question, you'll be disappointed with yourself at the end of the interview. But there is a, there are, there is a choice to make sometimes as you're judging the, the way the person is responding, if you like, almost in the build-up to potentially asking that question. So that's when you make a judgment call. Um, because, yeah, there, there, there will be and have been certain, certain people who might not respond that well to, to a question. I, I think that's happening less and less. Um, now in football in particular. Why do you think that is? I think because managers do more and more. I think uh, the volume of interviews that a manager and a player are expected to do now 
pre and post match is so much. There is so much coverage out there on social media too that's playing into the mix that um, even if your interview might be the first time that uh, that manager is speaking or that player after a game, there, there, will still, there will still be so much around it. The manager will then go on to do three or four more interviews. Obviously, you, you have to use the privilege that you get as a rights holder to use that first interview well, uh, because often that is the one that people will refer to most. But I think that's the reason why maybe you see less of those flammable moments because managers are doing more and more and they're probably better at it. Or maybe they're better at just deflecting things. Yeah, and I, I think also I suppose you're, if you're spreading out over the course of seven or eight interviews, your bandwidth is, is much more narrow, isn't it, in terms of what you can give emotionally as a manager? Yeah, well, that's why I think why it's also good, essentially, if you get that first interview, and there probably aren't too many reporters, journalists out there would say, no, I'll go third, thanks. <laughs> you always want to go first. You know, you, you, you always want to go first because essentially that's when that manager might be at his most emotional or that player, you know, uh, for, for better or for worse. Um, but I just think, I think even um, some of the more flammable managers now are better maybe at containing things because of just the volume of interviews that they do. And I think that's, that's just the way the game has, has developed. But um, so I think the challenge of the journalist is to try and be as original with your line of questioning. I was going to say, how do you differentiate in that situation, knowing that if you don't go first, you've still got to try and get something from that yeah. interview that viewers find both authentic, but also yeah. enriching in terms of their understanding. Well, I think it's, it's down to your style and how you do it. You know? And I think if, if, you're, if you're aware of it, and you're aware of that, that sense of keeping the person engaged, trying not to be caught up in what is essentially just a, uh, uh, um, that person, that interviewee saying what they want to say sometimes. You know? uh, you've got to try and maybe put them on the spot for their supporters, for your viewers. So it's just, just, it's just bearing that in mind, I think, because um, Listen, it is only football sometimes, and it is only the story of a match sometimes, and that's all it is. You go through, that's it. You cover, you cover those bases, and there you are, you know. And not every interview is going to be, uh, you know, uh, is going to be uh, laden with backstories and, and all sorts of potential headlines. If I had to ask you to pick out three managers that were your sort of... Uh, I'm not going to say that they were battles, because they would never have been in terms of a conversation, but do you have a back and forth with and that you find yourself engaging in a sort of almost game of chess when you're, when you're interviewing? I think I, in my mind, I think I know who you would pick, but I'm interested to know if I've got it right. <laughs> no, no, go on, tell me. So if you had to pick out three that you really enjoyed the sport of, sure. of interviewing? Uh, I think you would go Ferguson, uh, Mourinho, and then, then next it would probably be a few sort of jockeying for position. Uh, Arsene Wenger was, was always wonderful to interview for lots of different reasons, not necessarily in a post-match sense, but in a preview feature sense. Um, so th th those maybe are the top three that you would have been referring to. I, I would have gone Clough, maybe. Yeah, but... Clough in the earlier days, yeah? yeah. In my early days, his late days, not that old. But in, in, in his late days and my early days in radio certainly was... Um, yeah, uh, I, I didn't have the, the privilege of interviewing Brian Clough that often. Nobody did towards the end of his career. But at the points that I did, uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, an incredible challenge. Um, but what an experience. Do you love that when you get into an interview and you think, well, I've got to be on my A game today, otherwise I'll get torn apart? Well, I think that was, that's the thing, certainly with Ferguson. Certainly it was with Clough. Um, uh, and, and certainly to a degree with, with Mourinho and all managers, I think you have to, you, you can't be lazy with it. I think you, you, you can't sort of uh, assu assume a position of casualness with them. I think that, that upsets pretty much any manager. They expect a degree of professionalism. But certainly with Sir Alex Ferguson, um, in my relatively early days working with ITV, that would have been the mid-90s, Ferguson was a force of nature. And so to interview him, and he didn't, as I say, he didn't do that much 
in terms of television interviews then. Um, it, it was always a challenge, but a, a, a real special one. And why do you think he was someone that stood out in comparison to others? I think there was just a, a demand from him that you don't waste his time. You know, so he, he had an aura. And this wasn't just post-match. I'm also referring to interviews that we would do with him quite regularly for preview magazine shows throughout the 90s. We had a Champions League show and obviously Manchester United were constantly in the, the Champions League at that time, all, almost building towards 99 when he finally won it. So in those years building up to 99, um, he, he would often do interviews regularly for our Champions League preview show. And they would be, they would be sparring battles where you, you'd often have a news story to cover. With Manchester United, like no other club, there's always a news story, it seems, in the background, whether it's their transfer failings, whether it's a player not in the team, um, whether it's Ferguson's own team selection, whether it's the last match they've played. So there's always a sort of news agenda that you'd like to follow. And then there's his sort of way of doing it, which is his own agenda. And, and often his agenda was fascinating. So you'd, you'd come away very rarely from a Ferguson interview with nothing there would always be something it's just how much that something would be what you wanted to get <laughs> and how much that something was what he wanted to tell you um but he was um uh, a, a huge influence i think on every journalist who would have interviewed him in terms of i think learning how to sort of prepare for an interview learning how to deal with an interview it as it goes along learning how to as you say do I ask that question or don't I? How much is the interview potentially going to end at this point if I do? So the, the, those sort of crucial decisions um, that you sort of, maybe at journalism school, you, you get do hypothetically, well, it, it was one, you know, it was one uh, uh, potential lesson each time that you interviewed Ferguson and always a challenge, but uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Tell us a little bit about Jose then and how did his style differ? Because you, obviously created the, the documentary about him as well, which I adored. I loved seeing that, um, that relationship that he had with the players, but also the psychology mm -hmm. side of, of what he does mm -hmm. in, in his style of management. And it's clear from the documentary that was obviously something that you took an enormous amount of joy in kind of unpacking. Yeah, well, f I was lucky enough to interview Mourinho when he was a assistant manager at Barcelona and unknown. And I remember it was a Champions League semi-final in Valencia, Valencia, Bar Valencia, Barcelona, 2000, I think it was. And uh, we wanted to interview Louis van Gaal before the game. And they said, van Gaal won't do it, but there's this guy called uh, Mourinho who speaks really good English. We hadn't heard of him. And Mourinho did an interview with us. We, we did the interview anyway. We thought, well, listen, um, something's better than nothing. And he, he did an interview with us, uh, this you know, young, handsome, a uh, very direct, really good English speaker. And, and we used it because he, uh, he said something in it which was provocative, it was to do with Valencia's tactics. Uh, they were pummeled, by the way, Barcelona in that tie by Valencia. Um, but Mourinho was on his way and, and he was, at that moment, I could sense a, a, a charisma in him. There aren't many number two, number three coaches who you interview who, when you finish the interview, you think, that guy's impressive, you know, that guy's left something on the lens, that guy stands out. And, and you, we were to find out, obviously, a few years later, and, and we were fortunate, obviously, to cover a lot of that season when he really came to light, Porto versus Manchester United, uh, his um, superb displays, not only as a coach, but in front of the camera, which just captivated English audiences. Uh, and. And, and Chelsea was the next step. And so Mourinho um, was a challenge to interview because you were almost expected to get something superb each time you interviewed him. It was almost, well, what did he say this time that, that's going to be the headline? Uh, so I, that almost became the problem with Mourinho. I think for me was that, okay, I've, 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 quite, I've, I've underperformed a bit there. He, 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 he sort of drifted, drifted away a bit because sometimes Mourinho could obviously be in a bad mood himself and uh, be a bit tired and uh, be a bit sort of frazzled February, March time, especially during a season. But um, I think with Mourinho, it was, 
the challenge with him was not so much getting him to talk, but um, knowing that there's a real point, there's something, there's always something bothering Mourinho. There's always something, you know what I mean, in something a good way. Good, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. always something yeah, yeah, that yeah. you know uh, potentially wants to say, potentially that you can, a little, a little sort of stick you can nudge him with, that was just finding that. Sometimes, you know, he, he would come with his agenda. Uh, his agenda would be in incredible. You haven't thought about it in that way. And I think at his freshest and his best, which he was from 2005, I think, to around 2010 at Inter Milan, we did that documentary 2013 when he just won the title with Real Madrid. He was, he was untouchable, I think, at that time in, in his all-round um, all tactical approach, psychological approach, approach with the media. He, he was very special at that point. And, and it's very true what you say about that expectation with him. I think when, whenever I go into one of his press conferences, he walks into the room and you almost see a collective sit up of all the journalists because they think there's going to be a line yeah. straight away they think what is the line going to be today and i, I imagine that that saying the, the i'm the special one there was plenty that came before that but the mm. i'm the special one line almost showed a lot of people that within management there's that potential for them to say something in what could be a run-of-the-mill press conference that suddenly brings everyone alive and, and, and makes everyone sort of stand to attention. And as a result, it's sort of fallen like dominoes, hasn't it? You almost expect him every single time to come out with something That's it. special. That's it. And I, I, yes, and I think sometimes it is beholden on you to try and get that. You know, again, it's, it's, it's beholden on you as an interviewer to be original with your line of questioning. I think if, if you're a manager and, and you get the same questions asked all the time, it can become tiresome. So I think sometimes, as much as you have to sort of cover off editorial bases when you're going through your questions, it, it is sort of beholden on you to try and be original and to try and, you know, try and make them think a little bit differently. And I think with some managers, when you do that, like Mourinho, like Wenger, sometimes like Ferguson, they will respond to that. They like that, you know, and um, that, that I think that's the most satisfying aspect of the job sometimes. Um, I must ask you about Arsene Wenger just quickly, and I've got, I mean, so much to try and quiz you on. So just tell me why you found Arsene Wenger so special to interview. You could ask Wenger anything, pretty much. Um, and uh, he would give you an answer that would be lucid and frank. And that's even on, on, on some difficult things, you know, to do with his team selection or, uh, you know, to do with broader things in society. I mean, Wenger, you know... <laughs> Wenger's depth of knowledge, I mean, it'd be amazing what Wenger would be like on VAR. I think he's a big proponent of VAR, but uh, I, I, it's that sort of... He'd, he'd be able to give you, I think, in a very concise way, considering it's his third language, uh, a, an insight that you maybe hadn't th thought of. And I think Wenger at his best... And he, Wenger was never really at his best post-match. He was either too, you know, he, he, didn't really, he didn't really enjoy the, the match day experience, I think, pre or post match interviews. But um, the day before a game or relaxing in a midweek, talking football he, he, and other things associated with football, uh, his insight was amazing. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, actually. I remember my last memory of Arsene Wenger post match, obviously, like there's all the chat of I don't know, I didn't see it. Yeah. Um, but he never wanted to commit, and I always put, felt that he wanted to put a, an umbrella over his players in yeah. post match. Never wanted to let any of the barbs get to the players. Um, yeah, and also I think with Wenger, he took defeat increasingly badly. Right. So I think he, he really did struggle if, if the game, almost if the Arsenal performance wasn't perfect. He found that harder and harder to deal with, I think. Whereas a lot of managers with experience, you'd think it would get easier. Now, listen, you know, did Arsene Wenger peak in 2004 with the Invincibles? So, you know, after that, for the next 14 years, maybe it was never going to be quite as good. But um, he was always trying to get back to that point again uh, or to be perfect with the way his team played. So I think that search for perfection ended with Wenger being really hard post-match on himself. And therefore it became more prickly than it should have been. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose once you've achieved almost perfection, it's very, very difficult to try and get the, uh, get the mo well, not necessarily motivation, because the motivation would always be there, but nothing would ever feel quite the same. You know, you go a season unbeaten and then yeah. suddenly it's like, 
watching something crystal 4K and then just slowly dropping down to yeah, HD. Yeah, and, and I think that that, that Invincible team was built on a built on strength and power, not 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 the sort of beautiful style of football that Wenger in his sort of uh, second or third Arsenal time, you know, 2008 to 2012, the Fabregas years almost Van Persie. He wanted to to win with a style of football that was perfect aesthetically almost. That was the challenge he set himself and he, he was never gonna he was never gonna quite get there. Right, I spoke to you about a little bit about the Mourinho documentary. I want to skip on that I mean you've done so much brilliant work in terms of your your creative side and your writing and, and directing, but I want to skip on to, to present day and then maybe we'll go back. So Finding Jack Charlton, is that the, the correct title? I've given it the correct title. That is the there. correct title, yes. I so you've only just well only just got towards the end of the edit at the time of recording now so you very kindly let me have a little early watch so I get I get a steer on it I was watching it this morning um because it's literally just fresh out um and I was sat in a pub in East London having a coffee and I found myself like nearly bawling like it was so powerful um and I just don't think I was ready to to see it. it. It was so raw, but also so uplifting and exciting, but also at the same time, very, very uh, emotionally heavy. Hmm. Can you just unpack it a bit for me? Just tell me what the motivation was behind it and how much did you personally find yourself investing in that story as you were going hmm. along? Because we spoke a little while back and you unearthed some unbelievable archives. So that those two storylines sort of converging must have been um yeah incredibly hard to weave together without getting emotionally invested yeah i think well the, the original reason for the film was uh uh we'd made bobby robson more than a manager and it wasn't really my intention to make a, a film about another uh, great english manager but i i'd just been talking to a few people just about ireland and irish football and andy townsend who's executive producer on the film i got talking with andy and um, he mentioned there hadn't really been a, a film about Jack and his influence on Ireland from a sort of British point of view, an English point of view. A few television documentaries were made in Ireland essentially about those years. Um, and Andy would put, put us in touch with Jack and, and Jack's son, John. And um, we went to see them. And this was two years ago, so the autumn of 2018. And that was when we met Jack and Jack came to the local pub that his son owns in Northumberland. We met Jack and, and, and Jack was suffering from dementia and, and, that, and Andy had, had known a little bit about this. But um, the, the length of the, de the dementia, uh, the stage that it, that it was at, obviously told us that Jack wouldn't be able to do an interview. So we were wondering about the film and, and where we would go with it. But John, his son, was very keen to help. And so the film became a story then over the course of filming, not only about Jack and, and Jack's success transforming Ireland not just the team, but, but the nation, which that period did, which was what interested me. But it also became a, a story of um, Jack's uh, struggle with dementia, and uh, which of course is an issue that's becoming more notable in football and its connection to football. So those are almost the two big pillars of the film. And then we, we also uncovered, as you say, some, some wonderful archive from 1990, which we'd, which, which we'd heard about which really, I think, a lot of Irish fans and football fans will enjoy because the access it, it, it enabled us to get brings to life a lot of those apocryphal tales of Jack Charlton and the way he would lead teams, his team building, you know, we're living it for the crack guys, we, you know, we, we've got to enjoy it. Well, we, you know, we, it, we're, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful ride and we're all along for the journey. So that, that just brought to life in such a wonderful way that time whilst also covering a couple of other aspects of Jack's life, his relationship with his brother, his relationship with Paul McGrath, which were other windows into what made this man quite a unique character. And of course, what we had as well was, we began the edit of the film pre-COVID, COVID happens, and uh, we had to delay. And, and then of course, we were told that Jack himself was struggling. Uh, we kept in regular touch with the family and Jack died, we were expecting that. We, we filmed just a week before he died. So we had a lot, of, a lot of material to go at. We had a lot of different, as you say, areas to do with football, but also to do with dementia and Jack's 
uh, own life, which have made it a very exciting project for me because it's not just an archive-based documentary. It's, it's an archive-based documentary linked to an original storyline, which I think will make it, which is a challenge to make, but I think for those who watch, they'll really get a sense of who this man was. And, it, it, and he was an incredible man. One of the things that you just picked up on that made me smile immediately was that the, the idea of the apocryphal tale, the idea of there still being somewhere the idea that not everything was captured on a phone, you know, not everything yeah. was caught. There were these tales, these stories that w were kind of almost mythology that through this doc just are able to kind of like peek their head above the surface, you know, you're able to get that little window into something that before didn't exist. And I don't know if this is something that you share, but I certainly feel that at the moment we see too much. We see everything. And so there's a real beauty in the idea that in 1990, that wasn't there. There's a, there's a, there's a section, and I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but there's a section where you've done this beautiful shoot of going into a room full of his notes. And, you know, and you're almost left as an audience member trying to kind of like create a, an image in your mind of what that note actually means to play out visually so how was that for you is that something you got enjoyment from because i know with previous archive projects like it's painstaking isn't it trying to find that mm. that image that mm. didn't exist but suddenly brings to life what you're talking about yeah, i think it's just about authenticity i think and, and that's what i think in a documentary is what you want and you, you do want a greater connection to your subject because in, in the jack charlton story a lot of the, the the footage will have been seen by people like the island world cup story and to, and to be honest the games weren't that great. You know, Bobby Robson, more than a manager, had a lot of incredible football matches. <laughs> they were wonderful matches, especially with the Barcelona team. Jack Charlton, the way his team played, and, the, and Ireland fans will admit this, their, their, their great games weren't great games of football. So you're not relying on the football or even uncovering some, you know, some, some, uh, some special uh, footage from the games to really help you out that much. What you want is, uh, unseen footage shot behind the scenes, which we managed to get. What you want is notes, photographs, but notes in particular, in Jack's case, he made these incredible notes, a lot of them for speeches, a lot of them for uh, tactical seminars, a lot of them just his own brain working about what he wanted in terms of man management, which the family kept and which we were able to get access to. And then I think the challenge for us in terms of the film was displaying these in a way uh, because they are just notes, they're not, you know, they're, 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 a, a way of displaying it, which sort of gets you a sense of trying to enter inside his mind. Because obviously Jack couldn't tell us about that. So getting us inside his mind visually um, is a real challenge of the film. And I, I'm pleased that it, it stood out to you because I think that again will be another extra level for lovers of Jack Charlton, or people who weren't lovers of Jack Charlton, to enter into the story and, and, and really be aware of who this man was. Because so often you are kept at a distance. Too many biographies keep you at a distance, you know? They just go through the motions, the chapters. A lot of documentaries, I think, aren't able to get really under the skin sometimes. Um, and, a lot, and a lot of sports documentaries are made, and that's not necessarily the fault of the director, it's just the way things are. But um, we, hopefully we were able to, to just get inside the mind of this man and really get a sense of who he was and help, help the viewer make an emotional connection. Because I think emotion in any, in any documentary is key if you're going to keep the viewer there because there are so many, there's so much content out there to watch, as we know, you've just referred to it. So keeping the viewer there is the first challenge, getting them emotionally invested. So let's touch on, on, on the dementia side a little bit, because you've got some, from the political point of view, you've got an incredibly difficult line to toe there as well, in terms of really truly representing that story fairly and, and opening that up for people to try and uh, make their own judgment on on that situation then you've got the actual football story and then you've got jack the the character and the personality but then also there's this really important side to the story that is is about just seeing a man 
suddenly unable to kind of almost recognise his own past. So mm. just tell us about that from a creative point of view. How difficult is that for you to try and tell that story? Yeah, well, it, to, to be honest, Ben, you're, you're, you're dependent and grateful to the cooperation of the family because they're the people who can articulate it. So his wife, Pat, uh, who looked after him. She's uh, amazing, by the way. She's amazing, yeah, she is. And his son, John. Um, other, uh, other, uh, other people in the family obviously helped to a, to a real degree as well. But they, they were the two that we interviewed and, and, and spent most time with. And they are the people who helped to articulate it, you know, and, and, and it wasn't easy for them. So I think, I think it's one of the things that I learned during the course of the documentary is the impact that dementia has on the family. So not only on the sufferer, but also on the family, because they're, they're seeing a person change in front of their eyes. So, so their courage in helping explain how Jack had changed, their courage in helping explain what had changed about Jack and, um, and also their opinions on the uh, source of the dementia itself w was absolutely essential for us. And they knew we'd covered that storyline, but it, it didn't make it any easier for them, I think. At this point, I do want to just make sure everyone knows when this is coming out and where they can watch it. So tell us, how can people watch it? Yeah, the film Finding Jack Charlton will be released in November 2020. Uh, it'll be, it's also a, uh, a BBC film. So it's been commissioned by the BBC and it will be on in early 2021 on the BBC, BBC Two and Virgin Media in Ireland. And we're obviously going to be uh, selling it worldwide, fingers crossed, hopefully. But it will be on a, there'll be a cinematic release of some sort, we hope, in November. And it'll be also available at that point as well to, to download, to buy. Amazing. I, I, I can't wait till people can get out to, I would encourage people to go to the cinema and watch this if they can. Yes, Because there's too. so much, in terms of just beautifully shot pieces that actually deserve to be seen on a big screen and, and really absorbed, as well as the story as well, because I think, People will get a lot from it, however they watch it. But if you watch it on a big screen, I get the impression it will be be really special. Um, there's so much I still want to quiz you on, so I'll, I'll go two final two final things, two final docs that I personally loved: King and Vieira, the Best of Enemies documentary, and then More Than a Manager, which you touched on. So let's do More Than a Manager first, because you've already spoken about that. It, it felt like that was a very special story. Um, why did you go, go down that route and why did you take on that documentary in particular? Well, the initial idea was based on, uh, I'd just been reading a few articles and uh, I couldn't believe, and this was 2016 when we had the initial idea, I had the initial idea uh, that Bobby Robson was the last English manager to win a European trophy and that he'd won it with Barcelona. And that was, what, 1997. So there was this anniversary, 20 years on, 2017. Okay, maybe we can get something commissioned around that um, and, and sort of get into this, this sort of project idea of uh, what's gone wrong with English managers, too many managers in the, pre in the Premier League that are foreign. And, uh, you know, listen, a, go a good and valid subject in itself. But um, I then looked a little bit more into that season in Barcelona and you had, as his assistant, Jose Mourinho, you had the star signing, the young Ronaldo, uh, the Brazilian Ronaldo, as Mourinho says in the documentary, um, the, the best Ronaldo ever. Um, you had Guardiola, Figo, Stoichkov, um, who else was in that team? Uh, quite a few great Jeff players Cone from that time. Did at that time? No, was he? No, Koeman wasn't in at that time, but you had, you had this incredible array of players that he, he got and this job that he inherited was given just after being diagnosed with cancer. So then it, 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 it sort of became a, an obvious thing that this is, this is a bigger story than just English managers. This is something we can do around Bobby Robson, this incredible football manager. I, always, I already knew there was a strong archive of Robson from material that uh, I knew existed at ITV from his time in Barcelona that season, from his time at PSV and obviously around the England years. And so we looked at the archive, we contacted the Robson family, their great work uh, that began with Bobby establishing this incredible cancer foundation would also be a, a, a strong chapter in the film. And I think basing it around that one Barcelona season, which nobody really, I think, 
could remember that well because it was only one season, um, was the real uh, strong point of it and that enabled us to, to get the commission and to make it as a, as a feature documentary. Tell us, uh, for people that haven't seen it, I mean, you need to see it. You pretty much interviewed everyone that you could possibly wish to interview for that documentary. How was that as a process? And how did you go about getting hold of Pep Guardiola, Jose Mourinho, Ronaldo, and all of the, the, the million other people that you spoke to? Yeah, that I mean, that, that, that was one of the benefits of trying to get it funded, was that you had this incredible supporting cast. Now, to say to people who want to fund it, oh, look at the supporting cast, it's incredible, it's one thing, get, getting them is another. But Ben, it was easy because they all loved Bobby Robson. It was simple. It was, it was uh, the easiest process in terms of getting uh, interviewees that I've ever known. And they were all A-list, as you say, and all very busy people, Shearer, Lineker, Guardiola, Mourinho, Ferguson, Sir Alex. Yeah, of course. You know, who, who uh, had been influenced very strongly in his young management days by Robson's help. And it was incredible. And, and it gave us such a gravitas to the film and, but to answer your question, it was simple because, and even Sir John Hall, who sacked Robson, was part of the board that sacked Robson controversially at Newcastle, essentially ending his management career um, and hadn't spoken about the subject that much, if at all, on camera, agreed to do an interview because he respected Robson so much even though he knew he was going to be put on the spot for that decision. Um, and so that was one of the, the really easy parts of it. And so you don't always get that when you're making documentaries that people say yes, rather than no, 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 maybe, um, possibly. So, <laughs> so that, was, that wasn't a difficult thing. And, and it was, uh, I'm really grateful to those people for their help. And, and it's a sign of the esteem in which Robson was held, which I, I wasn't aware of at the time, uh, before we started that process. Let's do Keenan Vieira. Um, I remember when I asked this before, and we spoke about the idea of these two, um, you pointed out that Roy Keane sort of almost admitted to you that he was inferior to Vieira as a player. Why was that such an interesting thing to hear? I don't know if you actually used well, not those necessarily words. inferior, but <laughs> Roy. he said that he felt that as a footballer, yeah. Vieira was perhaps a little bit more pure, right? Yeah, but yeah, potentially, yeah. Uh, yes, I mean the the Keen Vieira documentary uh, was the the idea of Tony Pastor, who worked at ITV at the time, and it, and um, I mean Tony Tony did really well to facilitate getting them both in the same studio that day in Manchester. Um, or because they were both in Manchester at that time, obviously Roy lives not too far away, and, and Patrick was at, at City at the time, and they'd both been working a couple of times, I think, as ITV pundits, and, and Tony had this idea, yeah, why don't we get them together, and they can talk about that rivalry, and uh, they agreed to it, which was fantastic, and and there was a real um, edge. We're in this big sort of. Uh, studio space in Manchester. And, Very open uh, plan, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. And it was, it, the director did a really good job with it, Tim McKenzie Smith, in terms of just the way that we, we wanted to sort of have them face to face over a table and they both enter at different times and yeah, two gangsters arriving, you know, <laughs> to, to, to talk through things. It's like that, a Western, that, isn't that it? Was the sort of, yeah, the Western as well, that's another good motif. And so it was a really enjoyable day, but it was not without its sense of anticipation in the air before things began, as things carried through and even towards the end of the day, because we did separate interviews with them as well. We had a lot to get through in one day and that was a, that was a real logistical challenge to do it all in one day. And, uh, but, but brilliant too, because if you can do a whole documentary in one day, fantastic. Um, <laughs> but um, I think your point was about how they felt about each other. I think that they really respected each other to such a degree that they really enjoyed listening to the other one talking about how he respected um, them. So I think, I think that was, there was a sort of meeting of minds on so many levels. They were so similar and they hated each other on the field, <laughs> but really there was this mutual respect that uh, was unique. And I think it was the, the and it still remains the, the, the greatest player rivalry of the Premier League era.
I assume there's no surprise to you that, that Roy Keane's been a big hit in terms of his punditry. Not at all, but that, that, that actually was done in 2013. It's a long time ago now. Um, and Roy started his first punditry. And the credit to Niall Sloan at ITV, Niall Sloan did the call to Roy's agent, or manager, I'm not sure Roy has an agent, to, to Roy's manager, and suggested he come on and, and be a pundit for the Champions League final. Roy only does the big games. For the Champions League final, um, <laughs> Barcelona, Manchester United, 2011 at Wembley. And I'm pretty sure that was Roy Keane's debut on wow. television. And um, I think we did Vieira and Keane met in Villarreal at a Manchester City game against Villarreal 2011 autumn of 2011. And that was when this idea came to came to light potentially so it was just the two years before before we managed to do it but yeah you're right R Roy is so good because he's so direct and he loves football he watches football he's consumed by football and so he has strong opinions and can back them up with fact and and the, the other great thing about Roy is his, this ability to be concise and straight to the point which it's almost like he, he's inherited it from Brian Clough, you know. Clough was, he says, the greatest manager he played under. And I think maybe he's, Roy's, Roy took that from Brian Clough, that uh, ability to be straight to the point. Bit of a superpower, that, And charismatic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and with, a natural charisma. With that delivery as well. Um, okay, your final three questions. And I'll, I just want the first thing that comes into your head with these. Your greatest hit? What's next? And who is the person that behind all of the chaos and all of the madness and all of the long hours and, and crazy shifts and uh, I imagine like emotional ups and downs is the person that still keeps you level? When you say greatest hit, the thing that you're give, most give, proud of. Give me uh, most proud of. Um, oh, that's a really, really hard question. That's a very unfair one to chuck you, isn't it? Well, yeah. we're surrounded by awards and all these It's funny enough, I think, I think, I think um, it would be a documentary called The Fight of Their Lives, which was about uh, Nigel Benn and Gerald McClellan. McClellan. Uh, so away from football, a boxing documentary, which um, uh, was really hard to make, but really rewarding to make. Uh, that, that was on ITV and uh, uh, that, that, I think making that, was so challenging that uh, what's followed since has always been a bit easier. So that, that, that I regard that as being an, uh, something to be proud of. The second question. What's next? Well, there's a couple of documentaries in the pipeline. Um, one that we're starting filming on next week with a very famous football figure. I've asked those around me if I can say who it is, and I can't. I'm sorry. Oh, ben. no. But um, come back maybe in a couple of months. <laughs> I'm going to insert made, it made, in made, here. We're going to put yeah, a line of yeah. voiceover. Uh, um, so that, that's going to be exciting, yeah. Okay. And then who is the person that, whilst it's all mad and crazy, there's long hours or people that still stomach and take your uh, consistent need to travel around all over the place? Yeah, well, uh, my partner, Andy Bissar, she's incredible and uh, she's certainly been a major uh, influence on, on helping me at those moments. And there, there are a lot of those moments, as you say, very, very patient, but also, you know, she, she's worked a bit in the business too, so she can uh, put things in perspective and that helps a lot. But there's plenty of other people as well at ITV uh, and uh, at Noah Media Group, a lot of friends and colleagues who who were just, uh, who, who certainly put up with a lot, a lot of uh, rubbish from me. <laughs> um, Gabriel, it's been <laughs> such a pleasure. I, I can't thank you enough for, for sitting down with me, but also I just want to take this opportunity to remind you, please, please go and see the film. I mean, get a hold of it any way that you can, but go to the cinema and, and watch uh, Fun Jack Charlton because it's, it's stunning and, it, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a triumph and, and it's uh, really important as well. But thank you so much, Gabriel. Nice to talk to you, Ben.